Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and welcome everybody to this edition of the roundtable of the European Quidditch Cup Division 1 here in Harelbeke in Belgium. I am joined here by four guests which are going to talk with me about the future of Quidditch and thank you guys for tuning in. To my left, I have Felix Linsmeyer. He's organizing EQC since four years already. He's part of the Executive Quidditch Europe from 2015 to 2018. And is currently part of the Free River Sport Events, a task group with, uh, tasked with European Games in Bamberg. Left on the left-hand side from him is Beck McLaughlin. Thank you very much for coming, Beck. She's a veteran of the sport, playing since seven years, and has a lot of experience now playing in Bristol. And she was involved in a various amount of tournaments, playing in a lot of clubs, and as I learned now, in three national teams already, and maybe the number will rise again. <laughs> On my right hand side, I'm joined by Emma Humphreys, or called Jandals. She's been uh, a powerhouse of Australian Quidditch and uh, is uh, involved in the Quidditch administration there for five years. And she's now here as a New Zealander, spending her gap year in Europe, and thank you very much for joining our panel, Emma. And on the very right, it's Jack Leonard. Uh, he came up with the idea of the Quidditch Premier League, a uh, shirt he's sporting right now, and he turned it into a legitimate competition. And currently, he was nominated for being the young, British entrepreneur, the young British Entrepreneur of the Year and is one of the masterminds of British Quidditch. Thank you guys for joining me in this panel. Thanks for having us. In this panel, we're going to talk about the future of Quidditch. And for a start, I would like to, uh, you, Felix, to start maybe. And can you paint uh, a picture of what do you think Quidditch should look like in the next five or ten years? What should happen? So essentially, I think what we all want is for Quidditch to be better, to be bigger. Um, I do think that we should be having uh, serious conversations about what we want and how we want to get there. What I'd personally like to see is to see Quidditch become a much more legitimate sport. I think that um, there are definitely opportunities and for example, I think for example, Jack has been doing a very good job of um, sort of showing us that, also, that there can be a top-down but also at the same time a bottom-up approach. So essentially just grassroots Quidditch but organized in a very um, well-executed manner. And I think, um, for me personally, that's one of the one of the ways to go, definitely. Bex, if you could change anything in the time, how would Quidditch develop in the next five to ten years, from your point of view? I think there'll always be a place for mixed gender Quidditch. Uh, obviously, it's something that attracts a lot of us to the sport to begin with. But I think where we've had the emergence of women's only tournaments, I think that might continue to be a trend down the line, and we may even see like women's only leagues. There's always going to be a place for mixed but I think we might see the inclusion of a women's only game down the line. All right, and Emma, from your point of view from down under, <laughs> or like close to down under, what do you think should our sports continue to do or like change in the next five to 10 years? Um, largely mine is based on uh, the administrative side of things as opposed to the gameplay, but I would narrow that down to three things. So the first would be board governments versus management. Um, I currently think that uh, the IQA leadership as well as many NGBs are currently in a uh, sort of a state where your leaders are managers. They're not thinking about the future of the sport. They're not thinking about the development of the sport. So hopefully in the next five years, I want to see more of a transition and sort of a separation between those who govern and those who manage the sport. Um, the second thing would be um, mentality towards volunteering. I do think that there's a sort of a toxic mindset that um, the general community has towards volunteering. And for a lot of us who are higher up, that's completely not the case. Um, I think as well, that toxic mentality tends to breed reluctant leaders or for those that are passionate, they tend to become very burnt out um, just with the sheer burden of what's placed upon them. So I want to see that change and that shift um, from the general community. And lastly, uh, the transition to honorariums or having uh, small amounts of paid uh, or uh, paying a small amounts of money towards people that are passionate about Quidditch working up in the higher executives. I do not think that we can ever transition to fully pay, having a full-time um, paid roster. I think that that's a bit unrealistic. But I want to see in the next five years perhaps some transitions into paying those, um, paying those volunteers. Okay, Jack, as someone who's promoting a new league and maybe aiming towards a, a time where Quidditch is maybe a full-time job, how do you see the sport in five to ten years? How do so, you want to see yeah, it? I mean, I, I actually think Quidditch can and does uh, pay volunteers. So you look at US Quidditch and they've already got three, four uh, full-time employees um, plus several part-time uh, employees um, and my, my own company, the Quidditch Premier League, um, I've drawn a salary from that uh, for the last year and a half or so. Um, you know, not, not 
setting the world ablaze, don't get me wrong, but, but ultimately the money is there. So my vision for the sport, I think, is um, it's one of those truisms of, of politics that it's the economy stupid, but ultimately it's money. Money is where this sport needs to follow, uh, to, to look towards. Uh, it needs to look at how to expand revenue streams. It needs to look at how to um, develop a sustainable financial structure. Uh, and once it does that, then I think uh, we can start talking about playing in nicer places, getting more perks, uh, better volunteer um, uh, retention. But ultimately, it, it all comes back to money. And what do you think needs to change in order to get the sport into a more commercial line? And uh, maybe one of you of the panel is in against that, because a lot of people are very strongly against getting into a commercial line and want to have a sport uh, close community-based. How do you approach that? No, look, I, I totally get it. Money is, is icky, right? No one wants to talk about it. No one likes to, to kind of address it. And when you've got a sport and a community that's so grassroots as Quidditch is, it's something that can really be, be quite a taboo subject. You see the reactions whenever someone uh, suggests raising fees. I know Felix uh, uh, suggested, you know, adding uh, more Uh, fees to pay for uh, volunteers to be able to dedicate that time and improve the sport as an investment. Uh, and I think that's the way we've got to look at it, is, is uh, as an investment. You're investing in the sport's future. You're investing in knowing that that fantastic tournament director is going to be there next year. Um, and the ways you do that is start having that hunger and that desperation. So instead of saying, okay, well, how much can we charge each team for this tournament? Right, that's our budget for this tournament. Well, okay, well, how much can we get from partnerships? How much can we get from merchandise? How much can we get from doing a corporate event? How much can we... And slowly chipping away to get to the budget you, you actually want to be at, rather than squeezing your tournament about around what your players are willing to pay, because they're never going to be willing to pay enough. Yeah, I think you bring, bring up a very good point in that uh, we do need the money, But I also, at the same time, think that we need the time. And that actually will bring us back to we do need the money. Because I think the one thing that's holding us back is time. Uh, we were seeing tournaments that are organized within a year's time frame. And I think um, there is a lot more that could be done. For example, one of the things that would be incredible would be, for example, applying for uh, successfully applying for an EU grant. And that would actually, be, that would actually put us in a situation where we could Uh, draw in a lot of funding, uh, we could actually get a lot of more partners when you have those names. Um, but you do need time for that. There's about a, a 500 page, and don't quote me on that, but it, it's this huge manual that you have to go through. Um, uh, and you can do that when you have the time. How do you get that time? You need to invest in the people to have that time. I think another problem that comes up when you talk about Quidditch and money is, well, it's an elephant in the room. Who owns the brand of Quidditch, the word, the association, the writing on the broom, the snitch, and all that thing. Like J.K. Rowling has publicly acknowledged Quidditch once um, after the first edition of the, the Quidditch Premier League. And from my dealings with tournaments, you sort of say with Quidditch, and they're a bit um, like sponsors, are a bit oh, but oh, that sounds a bit a bit dodgy. Don't want to get into trouble. Oh, is it real? And yeah, where's the trademark? Where's the trade description act? Like going to fall on that whole thing. And whether we down the line just drop Quidditch that all together as a name, stick with stick with broom ball or I don't know, riding or five ball game or whatever you want to call it. Um, because we can't carry on like this forever because we're eventually going to reach an impasse with Warner Brothers. So basically you think the sport shouldn't uh, continue to search in the a number of players that are in, involved in a number of clubs because at a certain time Warner Brothers is going to say, okay, you guys have to call it hoop ball or whatever in order for it to continue? I don't think they would ever go after, that's the thing, they won't at the moment ever go after like, university students or even what the handful of community players who stuck around long enough, like, like me and Jack, but like... When it starts to things like the Premier League, like the fact that USQ pays their staff, like Major League Quidditch, all these things that are big brands and cities are getting behind, and oh, there's money to be made here. We want a slice of the action. That's when we'll have a problem. Right now, the level we're at, they're not gonna, it's not worth the bad publicity to go after us, but down the line, when the, it's turning over millions and of millions rather than you know, hundreds of thousands, they'll get involved. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. The question probably, the, the sort of the elephant in the room that you're addressing probably being how big do we want to get? Mm. And that's an important question that we should be asking. What is it that we actually want? 
Yeah, exactly. There's more than uh, money, and maybe Emma, you can add this. Well, actually, I think there's a big, uh, a large majority of listeners who we're not actually acknowledging here, and that's the players themselves. I think that when you talk about money, you're actually referring to a small proportion of administrative staff, but then you've got to think about the players. Do we feasibly want to see this sport ever um, progressing to the stage where athletes get paid? And I honestly don't think that's going to happen within the next 10 years, maybe within the next 20 years. And so I think as administrators, or the majority of us have been administrators, we're a little bit biased in that view. I also think it's important to acknowledge, though, that maybe going down the volunteer track is a better way to go, which is why I'm more in favor of honorariums, where you can invest money back into the sport as non-profit organizations, as opposed to trying to make money. That sort of side dodges as well the issue of becoming too big, becoming too capitalist. Yeah, right. And Jack, you want to... Well, I, I'm not sure I entirely agree with that, I'm afraid. I, you know, back to what Felix said, QPL has, has managed to expand our revenue streams from <coughs> player fee, uh, player fee only, really, to five or six different ones, including, you know, some of the ones I mentioned, purely because I have the time to be able to research opportunities, to go out speaking events and, uh, and promote the league and, and find those opportunities to make money. And ultimately, I'm not sure that investment, as you say, going back into the sport, is as well spent on short-term things like, uh, like um, you know, small stipends uh, as it would be on keeping one or two incredibly dedicated staff. And that's why you see, uh, you know, USQ doing very well when it comes to things like uh, securing city support for bids. Uh, there's a lot of discussion over, over the other side of the ocean about whether they do enough to get bids. But ultimately, their bids, they've got cities coming to them, asking and offering things. And as far as I know, that's never happened in the UK. Uh, which is which is one of, or, or likes to think of itself as up there with USQ. Uh, and the big difference in my mind is that they can pay their staff. I think what you're bringing up is a very good point, but there is a big statistic that I wanted to bring to the floor, and that is that of all volunteers worldwide, so that includes charity organisations, various other missions, 30% of all volunteers worldwide are in sporting organisations. I don't think that moving towards having paid volunteers, fully paid volunteers, is the way to go. Because there are so many diverse and so many talented people within our community. You're going to be restricting it to one or two very um, dedicated people who can make a living off it, whereas the, whereas the rest of the community suffers, essentially. By moving to a smaller pay gap and dividing that money amongst a wider group, you're actually going to attract more volunteers, which is what the sport needs. It's like you say, when you pay a one, you can't you can have one or two volunteers, but you can't run a tournament with two people. You need, well, I think currently at our European um, Cup, we're having all the, over 100 volunteers. Can we feasibly pay all of those volunteers? We can't pay them full time, but we can pay them in ways that will attract more volunteers for future events. But you have a, a tournament committee and I know that, oh, I'm in my team of, I think today there's 12 people running this tournament. So each job has been divided so small into like, they do a lot of work, but it's not the same as a full-time position and it's only for the eight month period or whatever they're putting it on. Whereas you know that you could take some of those volunteer roles and they would be subsumed into someone whose full-time job it is, like Jack was saying, to seek those opportunities to organize those tournaments. And I would happily pay a bit more uh, fee or whatever to know that I'm getting a quality product. That so maybe someone's not going to be earning 40000 a year or something. They're going to be earning like just over minimum wage or something for probably three days a week to start. And I'd rather have one person who's got an overview organizing everything, how a regional's going, how a national's, where's the national team going, and all of that, rather than 20 people trying to balance it a long time, a full-time job. When you leave the house at 7.30 in the morning, you get back at 7.30 in the evening, and you think, oh, well, I've got to be on a Skype call for two hours discussing what's happening with this burger van down in Stoke-on-Trent for our tournament. You know, it's better to pay one person a quality amount that they can get the job done rather than loads of different people. And we're now talking a lot about tournament organization, but in order for our sport to still exist in five to ten years, we need to think about other stuff. For example, how would the financial income for our organizers help our sport grow, get new players, get new teams on the horizon? What do you think can help them there? Well, I think, again, it's, it's time, right? It's, it's about being able to go out and speak to potential uh, players. Speak but do you need money for that? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I, I mean, if you're working seven till seven, at what point in the day are you meant to be reaching out to people? 
That's not going to happen, and, and in the nicest possible way. If we split the pool of potential money uh, and potential profits between 100 volunteers, well, in the nicest possible way, I think they'd be entitled to turn around and say, I'm sorry, that's just not enough to make a difference to me. And that's not going to change the fact that I don't have enough hours in the day to make this the product it could be. Now, I think um, ultimately we are beset by opportunities and threats and endless things come through your inbox every single day. That's an awful lot to deal with if you're doing this on top of a full-time job. And that means balls get dropped, opportunities get missed, and threats don't get dealt with. And that's why you see every time there's one step forward, we end up two steps back because something else has crept up and we're suddenly struggling with that now and we can't deal with that because we just don't have the hours in the day as a collective community. So, so ultimately, you know, it goes back to what Felix has been saying about time. It's throwing uh, investment into people who can then put the time into the sport to make it a long-term better product and better community, I believe, uh, for the people involved in it. And of course, another issue that faces Europe with the organisation is, so there's a president of Ireland, UK, Netherlands, Belgium, Italy, all of those people are trying to manage their teams and their thing and grow their sport in their country, whereas USQ, one, even though they've got, what, the same number or slightly more teams than we do across Europe, but there's way less administration, um, just because they are subsumed under one thing. So maybe down the line we get rid of national NGBs and go for a European NGB and pool our resources completely. Oh, I just remember where I'm from and that's a bit ironic, but <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. Uh, but yeah, there's some kind of, you know, European model. I mean, that's a good uh, way. And I think with this point from Bex, uh, we can start into our next segment, which is exactly about what you're talking about, our organizations. Yes. Basically, our organizations put uh, lead the path in what can happen in the next few years. And when you're talking about there should maybe be a European NGB or like an European governing body, there seems to be like there's a lack of what's happening right now. Like, wh How would you rate the uh, current work of the national governing bodies or like the IQA, for example, and how would you change it in order for like make our sport better or like grow? I think... Um, Quidditch UK has done a really great job having been around since its inception and seen where we were and where we've come to, come, like, ended up at this point where you know, there are lots of volunteers and like, there are tournaments going regularly and all this kind of stuff. Um, like, things are happening and it is good. I think the problem is the IQA is then a step that's too big. So we say we've got, let's take, yeah, so you've got Quidditch UK and then you've got our Europeans and then you've got IQA. It's not necessary. Um, I'm not saying the IQA doesn't serve a purpose, but if we take a sport like Jugger, which uh, they've been around for twice as long as we have, they don't have a, um, an overarching governing body. And yet they still happily run their, their World Cups and their things. And they've got slightly different regional variations, which even though we follow the same rule book, we have in-house rules. Heck, there's regions within the UK where they seem to interpret the rules differently, you know? So it's like, I don't think necessarily that all of that administration is necessary. You could have, yeah, Europe, North America, and that kind of thing, but then we then don't need like another thing on top, necessarily, down the line. Yeah, Felix, I think you uh, joined a group of uh, Kurdish consultants who try to like be between these organization bodies and like being on a very specific task when it comes to the tournament. Can you elaborate on your work there and how it may contribute contribute to like smaller governing bodies? So actually, I, what, what, I, what I would actually um, like to do is, is address uh, your idea of the European NGB, because in principle, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. I, um, I would say that it has a lot of challenges, uh, mm -hmm. just because um, they're essentially the same challenges that face, um, face us each and every year, where we have a tournament committee in a different country. We have people working uh, from abroad, essentially, working uh, virtually, and essentially, if you had something like a European NGB, you would be facing all of those challenges all at once, working with whatever the number is right now. I, I, mm. I don't even have the current number in, in my head, but just because you'd, you'd be dealing with uh, so many different cultures, so mm. many different administrations. I don't necessarily think that that's the way to go, and I think that, for example, USQ is quite lucky in that, because they have that large number of teams in a relatively small space, so that actually does enable them to, to have these kind of income streams, 
where they have a lot of people paying essentially for uh, a few, a very few people. Um, I would agree, I definitely would agree with your notion of some governing bodies being too big. And I would also agree with you that that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, for example, the IQA is redundant. I think the IQA serves a very good purpose. I think what we all need to do, and this is also where sort of the European NGB comes in, um, I think what we all need to do is, um, what I was alluding to earlier, what is it that we want? And what are the things that we're good at? Um, is the IQA necessarily good at, uh, at providing a tournament, providing a World Cup themselves? Uh, or is that something that a remote body could uh, potentially solve better? Um, and I do have to give disclosure that this is something that we're trying to do with the European Games. Uh, through our sport events. Um, I do think that we should be looking for ways of streamlining our work. Uh, QPL is very good at providing grassroots in a specific place and you're expanding now, but you have like local, uh, local organization. Um, I think, for example, the IQA should be looking, what are we good at? I think Quidditch Europe should be looking, what are we good at? What are the things that we mm. shouldn't be doing? I think, but also on that note as well, you saw something you said made me think about it. If we strip it back completely, then you don't have to include everybody. I think there's this big idea in Quidditch that it's like, well, I pay money, therefore I've got a vote. And I think Quidditch UK is one of the only NGBs in Europe where we don't elect a president, which, you know, that's got pluses and minuses. But sometimes when you've been in the sport longer, it's like, no, I, I, know, I know this is the right thing because either we've been here or we've experienced this. Like, take, take EQCs, for example. Uh, 2016, we had a 40-team EQC. A lot of people said, hey, we're not ready for this yet. 40 teams, we don't have the ref power, we don't have the coordination, we're not going to be able to pull this off. But NGBs who didn't really know better say they voted for it with not a lot of experience to know, and it was not a fantastic tournament. We tried our best, and everyone had a great holiday. But <laughs> it was not a fantastic tournament, and it's like, just because you want to pull up a chair to the table doesn't mean necessarily you should. And from another side of the world, uh, how is your perspective on our governing bodies, Emma? I actually wanted to, I've, I think I've outlined this document before, but it's actually the New Zealand government actually recently published in conjunction with Sporting New Zealand, a really interesting document called The Nine Steps to Effective um, Governance in High Functioning or High Sporting Organisations. And reading through this document, I think that this is a really good starting point or a good keystone for us, essentially, if we are thinking of restructuring our organisation. Because like I've brought in earlier, it really distinguishes the difference between governance and management. And I think what we can see, and this is one of the reasons why I support volunteering so much, is because we don't separate governance, because we don't have people thinking about outreach, thinking about ways to promote the sport, the kind of more creative um, purpose that the IQA should be fulfilling, um, instead, it filters down to management. The lack of volunteers requires the IQA in certain areas to step in, essentially, where it shouldn't. So I hope to um, publish this document later on so that more people can have a read of it. But I think it's a good starting point. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you've actually touched on something really, really important there, um, is that should governing bodies, whether at a national level or an international level, should they essentially be events companies or not? Because at the moment, most of them are events companies, right? They run their events, they run their, uh, they run their, their regionals, then their nationals, maybe a development cup as well. And, and that's about it. Because, again, that's all they kind of have time to do. Uh, running four or five tournaments a year is not easy. Uh, and it's uh, only going to get harder as the expectation gets bigger. So uh, I think, ultimately, our governing bodies need to be serving a purpose beyond that. Now, now you, you kind of asked, what was the IQA necessary, uh, Bex, I think, or kind of like having that larger organisation? <laughs> well, I'm and saying one thing or the other. It's just like opposing <laughs> you a asked, question. You posed the question. <laughs> a question. Um, um, and, and, you know, I think it, sh it should be. I think it should be. I don't think uh, NGBs can shoulder the burden of outreach, of press, of this, of social media boosting. The IQA has 70,000 likes on Facebook. Um, I can't actually, for the QPL page, include them in our insight tracking because it skews the data too much, because no other organising body in Quidditch comes anywhere close to the IQA. Now, whether they use that well or not is, is not the point here. The point is that actually they've got the groundswell. But because we've had three years or more of 
pretty mediocre governance from the IQA, NGBs have, rightly or wrongly, said, we'll take it on ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, now, two years on, year and a half on, we're now looking at it and actually saying, well, NGBs don't have the capacity to keep doing this forever. So whether NGBs decide to uh, let some of that power stop that power go back to the IQA uh, and allow them to be, as you say, the governing side of the sport again, um, it is, is up to them. But all I can say is that, that we're a private company, the QPL, and we're doing more private events, more corporate events, more things uh, akin to uh, the expanding revenue streams and the, the going beyond just running your, your own tournaments for your players than most NGBs are, which uh, you know, is, is great for me, but I think should worry people for the sport. But I think the problem with IQA, if you're saying, should the IQA be responsible for outreach? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think they should have more of a hand in it. You know, they've got the tools, they've got the name, and they've got the, uh, if anything, they're closer than ever to attracting the top talent in our sport uh, than they have been since they were refounded in 2014. So I think that should be the direction they're looking at, because quite frankly, them sitting around and doing World Cup every two years and some continental games, not all of them, that they were planning to, just isn't enough to justify their existence right now. But there is so much more they could do. There's so much more. They could be um, working towards a wider recognition of the sport. They could be speaking at conferences. They could be, you know, all these um, high-level outreach events that they could be taking part in and currently aren't because they don't really know what to do with themselves. And more to the point, the NGBs don't really know what to do with them either. Yeah, there's this kind of awkward dynamic mm -hmm. with like what do we what do I say to them what do they do like or, but I was thinking when, when I think of outreach I'm not thinking about a national scale I'm thinking hey oh there's a new team in my area hey what can I do to help them like I went down to a brand new team and I ran a training session um, and that team went to Dev Cup and then went on and qualified for nationals and everything and it's like I'm not saying you know that's all on me but <laughs> obviously but uh, going down and helping teams and like being expansion on the grassroots, that's going to reach many people. But some person sat in Toronto or Austin doesn't, doesn't care whether I go down to Winchester, UK uh, to run an outreach event there. No, of course not. And, and that's why it doesn't, the answer is not the IQA does it all or NGBs at the grassroots level do it all. It has to be a more coherent strategy so that both sides are being upheld, both sides are being driven forward. And at the moment, it kind of feels like both are trying to do both and neither's getting done. Yeah, that, yeah, because then that, that all then comes back to the top, top down, bottom up, the money, it all, it all ties in and it's like, which do you do? Which it's all do connected. Do yeah, Funny and, that, amazing. And, and how can we change that? Is it, a, is it a matter of trust? Is it a matter of understanding what the IKEA does, what my national governing body uh, does? How can we change like, uh, and get a deeper understanding of what we can do together to get our sport growing in the next years? I think trust is a very difficult one because, because the Quidditch community is so small. It's once people have got an opinion of you, it's quite hard to shift it because everybody's talked and everybody knows. Um, and what's that expression like? You either you either die a hero, or you live long enough to become a villain. <laughs> like, it seems to come up a lot, and then it's quite hard to shift. Like, well, do you remember you said this thing four years ago? And it's like, all right, like that was four years in Quidditch terms. That's a lifetime, but thanks for you know bringing it up. Um, so I think once trust is broken, it's quite hard to. As Jack would know, if something happened with QPL, like where would you come back from that? And that's why you've got policies in place ahead of time to counter anything that might like, come your way. Yeah, I think it's kind of a kind of a chicken and egg situation where you you definitely do need that trust, and the it depends on how you're going to earn that trust if you don't have the, the people and the numbers to back it up. Um, so I, I I don't really I can't really offer a solution to that, but I do think that we should be extending at least uh, the benefit of the doubt in that sense. Mm. But then you trust people, say like, take yourself, you're a very well trusted person, a figure in the community, but we don't want a point where like, Felix, oh, I can't do this anymore, I'm, I'm exhausted, I've been burnt out, and then we won't have someone to replace you. And like, it's not enough to then Felix to say, oh, my protege, and then pass it on to someone else, because mm. you've cultivated that trust in your personal, um, you know, trust that we have in you. <laughs> And that's something that um, I wanted to actually come back to because the big question that I keep asking myself is the situation that uh, Jack is describing is certainly idealistic. It sounds wonderful and it's beautiful and you put a big bow on it. It's fantastic. But I think it's ignoring the fact that it's basically relying on one or two very dedicated individuals who have the time or the money 
or something to fall back on essentially. There are people, like we were talking earlier, that you can't, there are certain people in Quidditch who love the sport but just can't give up their life, can't give up their job, can't give up their mortgage for this sport. And that's why I think, you know, is throwing volunteers at this going to be a solution? Well, it's definitely not going to make it worse. It's definitely going to help those people who are higher up feel more supported. It's going to generate a much more cohesive community as well. So for me, shifting that mindset away from events management, doing it on the side is okay, but it should not be the focus. Our focus should be more fixed on encouraging more people into the sport and increasing the community of the sport not the revenue. But it's difficult, isn't it, when events are the main way to get people to fall in love with the sport. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people around here can, can attest to that fact that either going to an event or, or hearing about an event was something that hooked them on the sport. So I think there is a, a, an incentive at the moment for organising bodies to focus on that. But, but what you were saying about, you know, uh, giving up your life for Quidditch and that kind of thing, you're relying on one or two people to do that. Well, that's... How is that less realistic than asking 100 people to work quite a lot of hours, hours that a lot of people would say that they should be paid for or compensated for at the very least, um, to hopefully not have a weak link in that chain and make some semblance of a tournament happen. You know, running things by committee is fantastic and does work, but ultimately if you look at any other sport, and you brought out a statistic earlier, 30% of volunteers are in the sports sector. But my question is, what other sport doesn't have its, uh, what other sport has its very highest, its leaders, people who are there and committing maybe five, six, ten years to the sport and doesn't look to compensate them? I imagine that within that volunteer, we're not talking the national, we're not talking the regional, be like, oh, I'm the coach of my team, mm. or I ran Kidditch at a school, or yeah, I take notes at my like team's meetings, and it goes like all of those levels, which you would see in, yeah, you would see in rugby or football as well, you'd see that everywhere. Um, but yeah, as you say, the top jobs get paid. But you, you mentioned trust in the IQA, and I mean, the IQA has had no shortage of trust issues, uh, as we're all very aware, um, and I alluded to earlier, it's had a rocky uh, first five or six years since it was, it was refounded. And, uh, and that's unfortunate. One thing I would say, though, is things do seem to be turning a corner. And I think a lot of that is down to the people. You know, that to suddenly see a new wave of talent, people who are totally uh, unconnected to the, the issues of the past and the decisions made in the past. And, you know, if, if someone like me, who has a heart of absolute stone when it comes to the IQA, can suddenly turn around and say, yeah, you know what, fair cop, they're actually making some improvements here, they're actually taking steps, not as quick as I'd like, not as radical as I'd like, no, but they are making steps. I think it would be the height of hypocrisy for me to not to realise that. I get people asking me, oh, you need to make up your mind on the IQA. Well, that's exactly what I was never about, was, was saying that the IQA was always going to be bad. I think there is huge potential for change there, and they're finally on the first step of realising that. That's a great summary, and with that, I would actually want to go in the last segment of our roundtable, and it's down to the volunteers. We've already brushed that uh, subject a couple of times, mm -hmm. but now I want to get like to the bottom of this. I mean, our sport is run by volunteers, and it's quite certainly going to be that for the next foreseeable future. How can we raise the appreciation for the volunteers? How can we keep getting these volunteers still going to the tournaments? And how can we put that prestige? Can we put some esteem and like some prestige on that job and keep the people? At least it's uh, motivated in their inside, not only with the money. The problem, the problem is that if you, if you go to a, a scrimmage between two local teams and they say, oh, I need a goal ref, then you think, oh, yeah, I do, and I can see the direct impact of what I'm doing. When you think, oh, well, I'm going to a tournament of 600 athletes, oh, I don't have to. Whether I, whether I go over it, oh, someone else can. And it's, I think people, well, people need to engage and realize that it's that they can do it and they can volunteer. Because the bigger we get, I think people sometimes get intimidated by getting involved. Um, and also like sort of then not, even if they do then have a go, not, appre being, not appreciating their own time themselves. Like I said to a friend today, like, oh, I don't volunteer at tournaments. Like I've done my time, I've run tournaments, like I've snitched. And then it's like, but don't you first aid all of them? Oh yeah, no, I do that. <laughs> you know, it's like, I didn't even count that as, even though I had to be at the field at a time not in the changing rooms with my team, but like wrapped in all my layers, like watching the games. But it was so low level, I didn't even like think of it as volunteering. It was just a thing I do. I think 
think this is a big uh, danger that we do have to be aware of. I think that at least you were mentioning earlier how people are expecting the tournaments to be of higher and higher quality each time we do it. That expectation seems to be growing exponentially at a certain rate that I don't think that a lot of our NGVs can keep up with. I think that this obligation to volunteer people generally tend to see Quidditch now as more of a commercial product. It's something you pay for and you get a service back. And although that can be a very beneficial thing, it can be our downfall. And I think we need to be very aware that we could essentially get to a point where we've grown too much, where we can't meet the expectations of the product that we are providing. And because people don't have the mindset of contributing to the sport, it's going to flounder. Yeah, I think that's very, very important. And I think the sort of the, the, the phrase that comes to mind, and it's going to sound a little bit negative in the beginning, um, is um, too much too quickly. Um, and I don't necessarily mean that that's what we're doing. However, as you say, we should be aware that um, we tend to want to one-up ourselves. We want to have the greatest tournaments we can. And at the same time, we do need to be wary of what you just said. We need to be wary of appearing too professional for what we're able to provide. And I do think that, the, that these things have a tendency to sort of become their own thing very quickly. So I, I do think that we also have to sort of be able to say yes affirmatively if we want to do something. Uh, but also we should be able to, for example, if no quality bid has surfaced, if other factors, if there's not the people to do it, if no one volunteers to do something, we should also have the opportunity to say no to something. I think that's very important. And I think there's, mm. a, there's, a, there's a general fear of saying no um, when people are expecting something uh, to happen. I mean, I think on, I think you've touched on something I think is the most important things of uh, part of communications in the sport, uh, PR in the sport, which is just honesty, right? You know, if, if you, there's not going to be something at the tournament this year, no, and here's why, mm -hmm. and you explain why, and I found that nine times out of ten that goes down so much better than you know any any fudge or just ignoring it or hoping that they don't notice that kind of thing. The one thing I kind of caution against, and you know, I think you all made really good points there about too too much too quickly and 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 exponential growth. The only thing I would caution is that I mean, is anyone else noticing that recruitment just isn't as good as it was three years ago? Right. Oh, in terms of players, like actual yeah, numbers. Yeah, it's just not as good as it was three years ago. When yeah, when you think about EQC and you think how many individual players have played? Like I said, oh, I've played four, you've played a few, you've played some. A mm, couple. A couple. <laughs> you've not played any, but you weren't yeah. here, that's fine. Um, like, these, all these things at the high level, the same people get a lot of, but that team I went to, you know, their thing, like, whoa, you played in Europe. Like, it's such an unobtainable goal that where do people think they even fit into this? But do we have a recruitment problem? I mean, uh, I would want to hear like from Emma or like from Felix because uh, maybe it's just a British problem because like where, where I'm playing, we have a lot of people coming in. There's a lot of new people coming towards the sport, a lot of new clubs. Is this like a cultural thing or is it like a global thing? Belgium struggled with recruitment. Belgium are losing teams. They're one of the only NGBs in the, in the world that's Norway. shrinking. Norway, Norway is, losing is losing teams. Ireland is losing teams. The US teams. has constant discussions about not just teams disappearing, but teams not say, saying, actually, it's just not worth it to pay. We'll play in our own time, chill, relax, but we're not going to contribute because we get nothing back from it. So, so my argument is people are losing enthusiasm for the original hook. that is, This is Quidditch, this is wacky, this is unique. And we're not being ambitious enough in pushing the other great things that make this sport amazing. You know, the gender inclusiveness, um, the, the fact that it does actually... Um, offer so many challenges, so many skills that other sports don't. It's so open on, on a tactical level as well. And I think we need to seize the initiative before we lose it, quite honestly. And that's why we shouldn't be afraid of growing too quickly in terms of what we're offering and what we're, what we're trying to achieve. You know, saying, standing in what is a pretty professional um, <laughs> first studio right here. You know, it's, it's ultimately we should be trying to push the boundaries because we won't get another chance. That's why I've said that like to new players on my team. So we did recruit, recruit about <laughs> eight of them. Fantastic. Um, you know, you can do this. You can be a ref. You could run a tournament. Like you can say on your CV, I was responsible for running a national event attended by people from all over the country or from Europe, and that's huge. Where you couldn't do that for football, nobody would come. Who would care? But like, just like that's a huge thing, and you're saying that's a selling point in itself. 
Yeah, there's so many complicated facets to recruitment as well. When you're looking at sort of the individual, when you're connecting with someone, for example, on public transport and you're trying to sell it to them, there's always that issue of becoming over-enthusiastic and someone goes, okay, and backs yeah. off a little bit. Um, trying to teach people how to communicate and sell the sport. Not every person is a salesperson. But then when you go up another level, it's teams. Like what kind of strategies can you look at to recruit for your team? A lot of people tend to go into their work circles or their other friend circles slowly. What happens is they become so absorbed in the Quidditch community, they then lose that sort of extra area to draw from. Mm. Um, a really good resource I found was actually one um, published by Jennifer Abbey from uh, the University of Sydney. And they had an incredible 36-page document about how they took a team of 20 and increased that to 80 in the space of one year. And that was done within a period of a couple of weeks. They had so many different strategies. I strongly recommend any clubs that are struggling with recruitment to check out this document. Yeah, and that's a great point. I think maybe that's something that you mentioned earlier that should be part of what the IQA does, like maybe not uh, running events, but like actually governing and being the police, making these guidelines. It shouldn't be like Sydney giving us these guidelines. It should be like our governing body putting these forwards and explain to us how we can communicate how great the sport is and how we can get people involved. I'm going to bring up something very cheesy. Go ahead. From World Cups, which was US National Cup 2013. Alex Bernabe, this has stuck with me for all these years, like six years ago. He stood in front of everybody. He said, you have to preach the love of Quidditch. And I was like, yeah, that's what you've got to do. You should, well, you don't want it to sound quite like a religion, but it's the same thing. <laughs> I want you to come and try this thing. And once people have tried, people stick. Um, one, of, one of people playing today is someone that I worked with for a month and I told her about it relentlessly, day in, day out, for a month. She was like, fine, if it will get you off my back, I will go to a training. And then she went to another training. I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. And now she's on the board of a, her club. Mm. But it's like, the, the elevator pitch isn't always enough, but if you can like, yeah, really, if you can wear someone down, then <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't even think you need actually need to wear someone down. I think uh, I think uh, there there is sort of this this thing where you might come off as overly enthusiastic. But I've had so much great experience in just showing people, not not telling people, even showing people the love of Quidditch. Like the the essentially, uh, oh yeah, I'm I'm mad about this thing. It's great because of uh, the inclusiveness. It's great because the community. It's great enough, great because of culture. And that, that has got me jobs. Mm. Like just, just, just telling that story mm. um, and showing that you have that certain enthusiasm for one thing and that perhaps you could translate it to some, something else. Mm. I think it's always a great selling point. It's also about understanding the person that you're talking to. I think that what happens is a lot is when you ask a person to speak about Quidditch, they get so excited and riled <laughs> up is that they forget to actually look at the person they're speaking to. Are they a sporty person? Are they someone who's a bit shyer? Are they more introverted? The Quidditch is a sport for everyone. And I think that when people pitch it, when they say the mm. same thing over and over again, you know, tailor your response. And that's Context something. matters. Exactly. So if you're going with someone really athletic, for example, I say, well, how's your agility? Like, how's your hand-eye coordination? Oh, have you tried running with a broom? It's really great because you go back into your sports. Or if someone's really, for example, in the LGBT community, um, sort of promoting that gender inclusiveness and sort of engagement within that and how we're promoting that. I think through various tournaments that we've been having as well, like um, the, I think it's the Herian Games that are coming up in Queen's Cup, about how women can, you know, tackle each other and, you know, have this full contact sport in a safe space. So it's about learning to read your people as well. I think that's something that's lost on a lot of um, younger Quidditch players, more enthusiastic Quidditch players. Yeah, and I mean... We, we, we focus a lot on our media skills, don't we? we, we you, you get um, people, NGBs, uh, all the way up to the IQA, kind of when they have an opportunity for press, and they say, okay, well, let's get so-and-so to do it, and they go through kind of your basic points, and they do a little mock interview and that kind of thing. And, okay, that person knows how to do Quidditch interviews with the press now. We never really do that for recruitment, though, do we? Well, why not? It, we need to train up a generation of Quidditch salespeople. So we need like volunteers for recruitment, and we need to train them. In your opinion, in my opinion, it needs to be more of a more of a coherent and and in its totality uh, approach. You know, at the moment, you might get the odd uh, person who comes in and helps out, like a gentleman, and 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 that's great, and that's so phenomenal because no one else is. And you know, there's no um, QUK had a had a great initiative actually. Um, 
way back when, uh, the Hooch Initiative, which was, oh, yeah. was getting teams, uh, new teams partnered with, with uh, older teams, and they'd go down to a training session, and one of those was Bristol, and the other one was Warwick, and those were two of Oxford's partners. Well, Warwick has gone on, both have gone on to be yeah. phenomenally successful on the pitch and in terms of size and recruitment. Uh, and I don't think that, that, that there's, uh, that's a coincidence. I think that absolutely having that support in the early days was vital. Where's that project now? Why do we not keep going? You see those cycles with teams where they're new and they're enthusiastic and they just, oh my gosh, I love Quidditch, it's so amazing. And then invariably there's some kind of power struggle two or three years in where they're, they're like, oh, the founder, a bit capey, do you know what I mean? Or we should play like a real sport and then there's this falling out and then thankfully those people graduate and then it moves again and then you get equilibrium. And when you're about five years in a team, they really, they they settle in, they know who they are, they know what they're about. But it's very interesting to see those and it's crucial to not lose them at that point. Like we've seen um, a few uni teams just, well, just cease to exist in the UK um, after a long time. Like some like really old established clubs that like won national medals like five years ago and now ended and it's like capturing those people as well. I'm thinking like, well, why, what's happening there and what are the, um, what are the alumni doing? Why, why aren't they helping? And how can we get these alumni and how can we get these volunteers to do more? Is it a matter of finance or is it a matter of, of honorary or maybe both? Lack of enthusiasm maybe then again, adult life takes over. You've already got one team to manage. Why would you like then go and help another? It's, there's a lot of issues there. Looking around the sport, I wanted to, or around this panel, I just wanted to, I just noticed something, um, diversity. I have just noticed that we, we can't ignore the fact here that a lot of us here are all white. I think that potentially there could be the issue that of there's diversity, a problem in diversity and struggle within that community. When you consider that the large majority of our players are coming from a university background, so they're coming from generally a lot wealthier background. Maybe we shouldn't be saying it's not about who we're pitching it to. We should be more thinking, are we actually attracting only a certain Definitely, group of people? Yeah. Do we need to think more critically about um, so other demographics, are we ignoring these demographics and the NGB is not paying enough attention to these demographics? Yeah, I would absolutely, yeah, absolutely agree with that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an uncomfortable question that no one seems to really want to address. So um, it, it's, it's uh, I mean, anyone as in organisations, there's, as far as I know, if ever has there actually been a, an organisation-led um, recruitment drive for non-white people? Uh, for, for, to, to diversify our player base. Has that ever happened? No, not that I can think of. And I've actually seen like the opposite. Uh, there have been like horrible moments of, uh, I played a team once, it was, the, it was in the American South, uh, and like on the opposite team, the wrong black guy got carded. And he was like, no, no, it was, it was that guy. And it was like, things like this happen, or um, like jokes about, like I've heard jokes about players like, oh, there's two Indian players on that team. Oh, I don't, can't tell them apart, even though they look completely different, like different heights, different body shapes, they don't even look the same. And it's like, we like to think that Quidditch exists in a vacuum, but it doesn't. It's a microcosm of society. And you see that the founders of teams then set the tone for a team. Um, I founded a team um, and we had a massively like, queer base to the point that we had like three like cis white men and we're like we have to make them feel like included in our team because they're a minority um but then you see teams that yeah have like racially diverse leadership they bring more players in because they can see themselves like yeah exemplified you don't always have to put this on the ngbs as well i think in aj's document they actually mention as well think about the diversity within your club how many, um, when you have your recruitment days, for example, at university, how many people there? Do you have enough people of color? Do you have people um, of, say, of different, from different countries? Do you have someone, for example, from the LGBT community? Um, I noticed a lot that in their strategies, when people approached the store, they kind of tried to make sure that they were paired up with someone who they could relate to. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, I think it's, you, no matter how enthusiastic you are, if you can't relate to that person, it can really create a little bit of friction. And that person already feels a little bit isolated sometimes when coming into the community. So maybe it doesn't have to sit on the NGBs. It, can, it just has to require a club or a club exec taking a good hard look at their com uh, committee or their community and thinking, what can we do to make this more accessible to more people? The London Unspeakables have always done a really, really great job with recruitment. They've been the only 
um, in the UK scene, pure community, non-graduate team until like really recently, I think the last season. And they're one of the more diverse teams in in the UK. And they, you know, they achieve it and they, and they play really well and done really well. I think this is a really important question we just raised and I would love to elaborate on that, but unfortunately our time is now up. Uh, and But I think uh, while I still have you in front of a camera, I would, I would really thank you for your time and the effort you put into this. And maybe we can have these questions, other questions for another panel and another EQC, maybe European Games or some other. I would love to have you by my side next time. But for now, thank you guys for joining me and having a good day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.